about the emergency treatment of stroke and sickle cell. Sickle cell is a source of stroke in children with uh, fair frequency. 11% uh, of all children will have a s overt stroke um, by the age 20. If you add the covert or silent infarct, which may or may not be silent, um, about 25% of people will have a stroke by the time they hit 20. Homozygous sicklers are much more likely to have stroke than other um, sickle cell forms. Um, and Doppler ultrasound, when done properly, um, can detect stroke and lower the stroke risk by 90 plus percent. The clinical presentation of stroke is primary with um, uh, symptoms of neurologic deficit lasting more than 24 hours. This time limit, limit is fallen out of favor because of the desire to intervene rapidly and to prevent um, long-term disability. So the common presenting symptoms of an infarctive stroke, which is the most common form, include hemiparesis, dysphagia, gait disturbance, or altered level of consciousness. Recurrent stroke and long-term morbidity are two common perils which we strive to avoid in the management of these children. Recurrent stroke can be reduced by long-term transfusion. Hydroxyurea was thought to be useful, but the hydroxyurea trial so far is not positive. Thus, long-term transfusion is still the um, management of choice. Untreated, two-thirds of patients will have a second stroke, usually much more devastating. Long-term morbidity, in a small series of 10 patients, two had major disability at the end of hospitalization, five had moderate disability, two were symptomatic but not disabled, and only one left the hospital without um, some form of, of neurologic deficit. Thus, we want to be aggressive in lowering their secondary morbidity. We don't want to wait 24 hours. We want to intervene quickly. And we want to begin rehab aggressively. So the first steps in emergency management are to identify the stroke and obtain some basic labs which you'll need going forward. The labs will include a CBC and retic, a chemistry profile with LDH. These two labs are going to help you do a couple of things. One, they're going to look for a low hemoglobin Low hemoglobin has been associated with stroke risk, both in terms of infarctive as well as hemorrhagic infarction. LDH is a marker for cell turnover and is an independent risk factor for stroke um, prognostically. Um, we want a type and cross match for a double volume exchange transfusion. This is going to be different than a regular type and cross match. In addition to ordering the blood, you're going to need to call the blood bank and tell them you're ordering this and you're going to need to call the head of the Red Cross, the medical director. They have a person on call 24 hours a day who will help you calculate the volume based on the patient's weight and hemoglobin and will uh, assist you in arranging this. This is going to be more work. You want to admit all patients with a presumed stroke to the PICU, even if they're clinically stable. Two stat consults have to occur. You have to call the peds hemonic attending on call and you have to consult the pediatric neurology service or the stroke team. In the case of a person with a hemorrhagic stroke, you also want to have a stack consult of PD neurosurgery. Imaging is uh, a critical step early in the process, but problematic. Imaging is essential for making an accurate diagnosis as well as understanding the prognosis for secondary uh, uh, damage. The three options you have are a CT scan without contrast, a CT scan with contrast, or an MRI. The CT scan without contrast is very useful in the emergency setting looking for um, collections of acute blood. Thus, you can rule out an intracranial hemorrhage, which is an important diagnostic thing, step because of the much more grim prognosis um, of an intracranial hemorrhage. A CT scan without contrast, though, can't see infarctions 
and it can't see old blood. Thus, it's limited. A CT scan with contrast can see some evidence of infarction, but it's limited in terms of its resolution, and more importantly, it's limited by its um, ability to interfere with sickling and cause further injury to the patient. Um, it's also less detailed. The MRI, along with an MRA, MRV, is the definitive study. And this may or may not be able to be done emergently. But if possible, and it won't, and it won't interfere with definitive treatment, it should be pursued. You have excellent imaging of the brain as well as the vascular structures when you do the vascular sequences. You can definitively look for acute as well as chronic um, ischemia. Gadolinium will not affect the sickle cells, so you can do this before uh, an exchange transfusion. But it is slow and it may, def may delay definitive treatment. So in the construct of a patient who is about to get a line and get the exchange transfusion going, put the MRI on second tier. Do that once the patient's stable after the treatment. The treatment for an acute stroke is um, still not clear. However, one of the treatments that is clear is the need for transfusion. And like in any transfusion, you have a choice of simple transfusions versus an exchange transfusion. A simple transfusion is when you simply give people blood like um, you would a cancer patient or some other chronically transfused patient. An exchange transfusion is when you remove blood, whole blood, from the patient and then infuse reconstituted red blood cells um, in equal volumes until you, cal until you reach a calculated double red cell um, volume. One of the advantages of using the Red Cross uh, medical director is that they are able to calculate this dose and get the blood ready for you um, rapidly. Um, so be in contact with them when you make the diagnosis and start having them work on getting the blood units going. They will need lines. Minimum they'll need are two large bore IVs. Preferably they have a phoresis catheter with two lumens or some other double lumen, double lumen central line that is large enough bore to handle the exchange. This allows you to use a mechanized exchange machine like a, a cytophoresis machine which can remove blood more continuously so it's easier on the patient to tolerate and you have more control over reconstituting the plasma. Um, uh, but in a case where you don't have access to one of these machines or you don't have timely access to one of these uh, machines and the technicians that run them, manual exchange has been shown to be effective and this requires you to use reconstituted red blood cells and um, syringe pumps, removing syringes full of blood and then replacing them with equal volumes of blood until the double volume target is reached. Once the patient's quantitative hemoglobin S level is below 30%. CT contrast is safe. So if additional CT scanning is needed and you need contrast, that's the time to do it. Long-term planning for these patients is they're going to need chronic hypertransfusion for an indefinite period of time, likely forever. Therefore, particularly if they have bad veins, putting a central line in them is a useful thing. So having the surgeons convert their temporary freezes catheter uh, into a port cath or some other kind of central line is a profitable use of a consult. Again, again, again early intervention has been proven to show marked improvement in neurologic outcome and so aggressive use of physical therapy and occupational therapy these people should be rehabbing in the PICU. Assuming they're stable and assuming you aren't doing something else to them, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and educational therapy should be involved actively. Long term, use the school-based systems. The schools are required to provide physical therapy as well as vocational and occupational rehab to all children under the age of 19. Therefore, 
getting those people involved is very helpful for outpatient follow-up. It will save your patients a lot of money and a lot of uh, organization can be done before they leave the hospital. Cerebral hemorrhage or intracranial hemorrhage is a less common type of stroke than the vaso-occlusive events. Only about a third of the, vaso of the uh, uh, strokes will be uh, intracranial hemorrhage. However, even though these are less uh, common, they are much more severe and have a much higher more mortality rate um, than um, obstructive uh, stroke. The presenting symptoms may be different. While they can present with hemiparesis and dysarthria, um, they oftentimes present with focal deficits, or they'll present with meningeal symptoms of stiff neck, headache, vomiting, photophobia. Um, and uh, one of the classic symptoms is coma in the absence of hemiparesis. So if you see somebody in a coma and their uh, arms and legs seem to have essentially normal tone, be worried about an intracranial hemorrhage. Imaging for all stroke patients involves looking for evidence of intracranial hemorrhage. And we talked about using a non-contrasted CT for that. But also looking for the vascular anomalies that may cause them. And this is where the MRA, MRV come in. Both aneurysms and moya moya uh, are common problems in sickle cell. Aneurysms are involved in about 45% of children with uh, intracranial hemorrhage. Oftentimes they have multiple aneurysms. Um, moya moya is the development of abnormal blood vessels uh, in a post-obstructive uh, response. Um, and these small abnormal vessels are easily ruptured, uh, resulting in intracranial hemorrhage. So that's it for the acute management. Further questions, drop me an email. Thanks. Bye.